Hello, hello, my friends. Welcome to this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Yes, this week's podcast is all about deep learning, AI, and the Open Vino Toolkit. But first, pop quiz time. When did synthetic biology begin? Okay, that question is a bit sneaky. The term synthetic biology was actually first coined way back in 1910. But the first real work synthesizing biological material didn't start until 1973, when the first molecular cloning and amplification of DNA in a plasmid was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America. But now, my friends, a revolution in the world of synthetic biology is taking place, with a little help from machine learning. So get this, a team of researchers at Berkeley Lab have recently developed a new tool that uses machine learning algorithms to guide the systematic development of synthetic biology. So let's back up to that timeline I mentioned earlier. Why did it take so long to get from the initial discovery of synthetic biology to the real developments in the field? Because innovation here means not only a complete understanding of each part of the cell, but also what it takes to manipulate that cell. It takes years and years and years to figure this stuff out, folks. Well, until now, that is. So now, with a specific set of training data, this team from Berkeley Lab has discovered that their algorithm is able to predict how changes in a cell's DNA or biochemistry will change its behavior. And then, most importantly, is also able to make recommendations for what should come next and even give the probability of the desired outcome. So the algorithm at the heart of this discovery is called ART, or Automated Recommendation Tool. And as you can undoubtedly imagine, this specific algorithm has been trained with certain information specific to the synthetic biology field, including the need to quantify uncertainty, recursive cycles, and small training data sets. Importantly, those data sets included historical and simulated data from previous metabolic engineering projects. So, how did they test this algorithm? Well, they first started with an experiment that hoped to increase the production of tryptophan in baker's yeast using a metabolic engineering process. In this experiment, they used five different genes, which are controlled by different gene promoters and other mechanisms within the cell. In total, they were looking at almost 8,000 different combinations of biological pathways. Now, using only a small set of that experimental data, their tool was then able to determine which out of the other 7,000 plus combinations would affect tryptophan production and ultimately recommended increased tryptophan production by almost 106% over the -the state-of-the-art reference strain and 17% over the best designs used for training the model. So basically, it worked even better than they thought it would. And not only that, the amount of information needed to train the algorithm actually surprised this team of researchers as well. With only using around 3% of the data available, it seems that this algorithm learned rather fast as well. This team does contend that to fully realize synthetic biology's potential, More algorithms will need to be trained with a whole lot more data. Head researcher in Berkeley Lab's Biological Systems and Engineering Division who led this project, Hector Garcia Martin, sums up this project like this. He says, 
The possibilities are revolutionary. Right now, bioengineering is a very slow process. It took 150 person years to create the anti-malarial drug artemisinin. If you were able to create new cells to specification in a couple weeks or months instead of years, you could really revolutionize what you can do with bioengineering. He goes on to say, if we could automate metabolic engineering, we could strive for more audacious goals. We could engineer microbiomes for therapeutic or bioremediation processes. We could engineer microbiomes in our gut to produce drugs to treat autism or microbiomes in the environment to convert waste to biofuels. Wow, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> so if you want even more information about this study, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com. All right, it's time to bring in Aaron Terstig from Intel to talk about how you can get started on your next AI design using the OpenVINO Toolkit. All right, let's go. Hi, Aaron. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Amelia. It's great to be here. Okay, so we're talking about AI inferencing and the Open Vino Toolkit today. But before we get into the details, Aaron, what do you see are the biggest challenges in terms of AI inferencing today? I would say the biggest challenge for a lot of developers that are doing AI inference would be the easy button. And when I say the easy button, it's being able to implement what they're being asked of from their customers quickly, easily, with less friction. There are a lot of choices from a framework and implementation perspective, and we're working diligently to just make it easier for developers to learn about the technology and get things implemented as quickly as possible. Okay, so let's dive into some of the details about OpenVINO. Tell my audience more about this toolkit. And I really personally liked its right once deploy anywhere approach. Indeed. Uh, AI is changing every market, and Intel really sees the opportunity to apply AI at the edge is a huge opportunity for growth. So what we decided to do was to invest in a engine that allowed developers to quickly and easily take AI models from their favorite frameworks and then deploy them at the edge to ingest data such as video or uh, time series data or natural language to come into a particular system and then to infer what that data is, to recognize those patterns, to say, oh, that's a face and I know who that is, or that's a weld and I see a, an anomaly in how that data is coming in. And then they can alert the engineers that are making decisions about product quality or safety that, yes, looks good, green light, or, hey, there's a problem here. That makes sense. Now, Aaron, what has the adoption of OpenVINO looked like? Are you getting a good response from designers? We are. OpenVINO's adoption rate is ramping very quickly. We've, we're kind of new to the game here. We've tool has only been publicly available for about two years, but we're seeing massive adoption in terms of customers that are downloading the product to use in their applications, as well as design wins in the market where people are creating products that could then be sold to customers. Cool. So, Aaron, if my audience wants to get started with a new AI project, what would you recommend keeping in mind as they move forward? So really, when it comes to AI, it comes down to what's the problem you're trying to solve. And AI is, in, in some regards, just amazing magical technology where you can train a system to recognize information, see patterns, and uh, provide input. Uh, this could be something as simple as uh, handwriting recognition, optical character recognition, or it could be even more complex like product quality and textile weaves. We see a lot of applications across the board that customers are eager to get started with. But the, the question is, like, how do you get started with this? I mean, you can simply download the tool and there are sample code and reference implementations associated with that. But we also offer a, an extraordinary and a unique product called the 
Intel Dev Cloud for the Edge. And this is a place where developers can go and not only learn about implementing AI inference solutions, but they can see reference implementations based on particular verticals. And then they can take these implementations and apply them to high performance compute or low power, less performant computing, where you know you, you have that trade between energy consumption and how much uh, compute power you want in terms of throughput. The Dev Cloud for the Edge allows you to select CPU, GPU, VPU, FPGA, and then apply these workloads to see what kind of performance you're going to get. But the mm-hmm. core of the Dev Cloud, in my opinion, is really a try before you buy and really learn about how these inference engines run and how to configure them for various use cases. The Dev Cloud includes things like medical imaging scanning, like lung segmentation, brain segmentation, mammography. It includes the reference implementations for like safety worker detection of helmets and vests or retail implementations such as just people counting so that people who run retail establishments know how many customers are coming in and out of their particular store. Once you've used the Dev Cloud for the edge, you can have a sense of what the capabilities are. And then we encourage you to download the software, run it on your local machine and, and take those reference implementations and build applications that you see really solve your customer's particular problem. Excellent. All right, Aaron, I think it's time for your off the cuff question. Now, since you haven't been on my show before, we're doing a little COVID special these days. So uh, if you could have one meal right now, doesn't matter if the restaurant's been closed, you need a passport to get to the country, whatever it would take, what would you have right now? Sushi. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Good answer. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, we have a lot of customers in the medical imaging space in Japan. So I've been over there quite a bit. And if I get on a plane and go to Japan and enjoy some world-class sushi, that would be awesome. There's takeout options, but it's not the same as like being in a restaurant, watching the sushi chef and the art of making the sushi. I've- I agree wholeheartedly. And yes, I have been to Japan once and eaten sushi at the Narita airport. (laughs) That's good enough for me (laughs) for now. Awesome. (laughs) Well, Aaron, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about OpenVINO and the benefits that it provides to developers around the world. Okay. It's another pop quiz. I know. I know. I've got some kind of mean streak today. So what is a nook? If you said something that Larry, Curly, or Moe would have said in a quite comedic manner, well, yes, you are right, but not exactly what I was looking for. The nook I'm referring to is a next unit of computing. These compute elements are actually small form factor, bare bones computer kits and components that are great for a wide variety of system designs. And I'm talking about them in a brand new episode of Chalk Talk with Kristen Brown from the Intel System Product Group. We chat all about how these pre-engineered solutions from Intel can provide the appropriate level of computing power for your next design with a minimal amount of development effort from your engineering team. And you can check out this episode of Chalk Talk by clicking the link below the player on this week's fish frying page by checking out the Chalk Talk section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or you can also head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash EE Journal. And hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you want to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D 1978. And if LinkedIn is more your thing, well, sure, I dig it. You can follow me or us on LinkedIn as well. And don't forget, we have that YouTube channel I mentioned earlier, youtube.com slash EE Journal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can also subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or the iTunes Store. 
And remember, if you want any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Frying page. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or if you just want to chat, I promise I will respond. I also really want to know what kind of stuff you want to see in future episodes of Fish Fry. So shoot me a line at amelia at eejournal.com or you can post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of November 20th, 2020, I'm Amelia Dalton and you've been fried.